also be able to ink a brush in such a way, and this is terribly decadent, they could dab grapes on the vine and have dark ink where the shadow and no ink at all with a highlight. That's when they started getting mixed up with Western ideas about shadows and perspective. They didn't have that. So, but they were so skilled in the handling of, of ink that they would do this sort of thing and they would imitate, you see, all the, the uh, so-called uh, rough natural effects of the great Zen artists. And so uh, today in Japan, a younger generation of artists has decided it's time to break all that up. If you imagine, for example, haiku parties, the writing of haiku poetry. Basho, who was the great 17th century master of haiku, said, get a three-foot child to write haiku. Because they're the sort of direct, guileless things that children would say. But now that a magazine is devoted to haiku, there is every issue will be 10,000 haiku, written by people all over the country. And they get so skilled and so affected that one which one has never heard of haiku. The same thing is starting over here. And uh, you should see the entries we get in these high school competitions that uh, Japan Airlines and other people sponsor. But it all after a while becomes dated, filtered, and so somewhere again the new thing has to break out, which is always coming up. So there's no formula. Or fixing it so that you can do it again and again and again because the moment you start doing it again and again and again it isn't in anymore the, the the real thing is it takes do you remember some time ago there was a fashion for having raw iron fish just the outline of the fish some artists originally you know took the fish together and it looked great but then you suddenly found them in every gift shop and dime store and they look perfectly terrible so this is a mysterious thing well, not only in the art, but in the lifestyle, in everything, when you start, this is it. It's gone. Same in education. Same in music. The moment you start teaching something, well, you want something you ask. How could we, is there some method whereby in our school, we could produce from the music department every graduation ceremony three music to the musicians of the statue of Bach or Mozart. Now, if we knew how to do that, that knowledge would prevent us from being surprised by the work that we do. Because we would know how it's done. And when you know how something is done, it doesn't surprise you. That's why there's a Zen poem which says, if you ask where the flowers come from, even the God of Spring doesn't know. Suddenly, the God of Spring would be supposed to know where the flowers come from. But the truth of the matter is he doesn't. And so in the same way, uh, if you ask the Lord God, how do you create the universe? He said, I have no special method. <laughs> <laughs> and this, uh, this was known in Zen. It's a very difficult, this is the most difficult virtue to say. something doesn't stand out like a sore thumb. But it is absolutely different from being modest. A 
If there is, let me repeat, if we do know the method, and we know it entirely, it ceases to be a threat. There are no surprises left. And the moment the element of surprise is gone, that it possesses the light is gone. That, you see, is why it's very difficult to teach them to yourself. But you can't easily surprise yourself. difficult to cure yourself because when you pat yourself on the back you know when you're going to do it. <laughs> so you're already for it. When somebody else comes up and slams you on the back, and that's a surprise. And what you needed was a surprise. Or it's like a joke. What makes you laugh about a joke is the element of surprise. That's why jokes aren't funny after they've been explained. So in the same way, all these then stories if explained, have no effect. They are intended to produce what I would call metaphysical laughter. So this has to be a surprise. And so as to be surprised, well, it is no way of premeditating. So we we'll see, if you read, for example, the book out here called Them by Oyek and Perigal, who studied archery, many of you probably read this book. He had to learn to pull the bowstring in the manner of the Japanese archer and let it go, but not on purpose. He had to let it go without thinking first, I'll let it go, and then let go. He had to let it go not on purpose. How do you do something not on purpose? 